Monologue 51, A Spiritual Marriage, Priestly Training 4 The rite of death and resurrection might be viewed as a wedding shower or bachelor party, and all that has come before is preparation for the rite of spiritual marriage. However, the rite does not take place in the realm of matter and flesh. Rather, it is something done alone in the privacy of one's own temple space. You shall begin as with any meditation. Relax, breathe deeply, let go of your tension, draw in the golden white light, and chant the divine name of your preference. Having prepared yourself, therefore, you are to see before you a doorway of light up here. Visualize this, and mentally walk through that doorway. Before you shall appear a corridor of fire and light, swirling as a vortex. Look back and see the earth below behind you. Look forward down the tunnel and know that it leads to the sun. Mentally move along the corridor, winding this way and that way ever so slightly. The sun grows larger in your vision, but rather than a sphere, it becomes a great funnel into which your tunnel leads. The light is divided as you approach into a vortex of colorful bands, as if a rainbow vortex. The spinning corridor continues on through the star and out across the galaxy itself toward the center thereof. Visualize the galaxy upended as you move, so that you are facing the center of the galaxy head on, perfectly aligned to the black hole at the core of the dense cluster of stars that masks the heart. The corridor of whirling fire and light continues onward as if a glass tube of radiance. Look back and see the distant yellow light of your star, the Earth's sun. Look forward and see the tube continuing into the distance, intersecting the center of the black hole. Beyond the tube, there is only the void of outer space. Onward, mentally, move toward the hole as if you are a wind. The black hole looms, but something hangs just above it, and a ring of light surrounds it like a halo. The halo is a neural-like network of ghostly white, forming a donut-like torus around the great black pit. The halo is the galaxy itself, and the galaxy has become the torus of phantom nerve works. The solar systems of the galaxy have become the nodes, or intersections, of the donut-shaped web, bathed in faint golden glow. The blackness of the pit shifts toward a magenta pink and a fiery haze, and the pit has become a great cube of black obsidian, its smooth, reflective surface glinting with purple-red hues. A point of blue-white radiance can be seen where the tube intersects the center of the cube wall, and as you draw closer, you can see that the cube is not obsidian, but deep blue-black waters. The opening looks like a portal of light, flanked by a black marble pillar on the left side and a white marble pillar on the right, embedded into the wall itself. The two pillars are topped by a gray marble lintel that is engraved with the words, Only Truth Can Free You. You cannot see past the opening because of the brilliant white-blue light. Yet there is a strange scent like that of an apple orchard wafting into your nose, carried by a cool breeze that swirls about in the moist, warm air of the tube. Below the golden shaft, the black hole, like the heart of a great spinning funnel, turns beneath you, emitting a dull roar like that of an immense waterfall. Beyond the rim of the vortex, you can see the edge of the interwoven branches of the neural torus, like the wall of a frosted glass viney hedge, twinkling from the stars and solar systems within the veiny pathways. Passing between the pillars, you are enveloped by cool dampness, and find yourself walking through a misty void, on a causeway of gold glass, toward a cube of golden fire at the center of the greater cube. 
Whispering voices, murmurs can be heard within the sweet-smelling fog, and fleeting movements are glimpsed here and there. From your vantage, you can see a green causeway coming from the right side of the greater cube, and a red causeway leading from the left side of the greater cube, both intersecting the central cube of light and fire. You intuitively know that there is another causeway on the other side of the cube, opposite from the one you are on, blue in hue. A fiery white pillar emanates from the top of the fiery cube and a fiery black pillar from the bottom. Advancing toward the inner cube, let the images of your life pass before you, taking responsibility, releasing your pain and guilt with each step. Your body is naked and illuminated, becoming more and more transparent as you near the heart. Feel the heat and the light of your form and face. In your memory, the worst deeds of your existence, own them and give them to the fire as you reach the wall of flames. The cube is as a blast furnace, the heat intense. Your life rushing through your mind's eye and every wickedness you have committed is remembered. There is an accusing and hateful presence in the fiery cube as if the flames are alive and within them you see demonic faces appear and disappear. Their burning eyes fill with judgment. The faces of people who have judged you all your life, including your own. Stepping into the flames, your sins burn away and are left behind you. Behold, you stand within a golden stadium of gold and crystal, filled with luminescent beings with and without wings, human and inhuman, beneath a stormy sky, flashing with lightning and reverberating with thunder. The lightning is living spirits, and the thunders are their voices, speaking things that men cannot comprehend. There is a floor of blue glass, beneath which you can see churning, glowing, mystic blue clouds. A ring of men and women, wearing white, black, or gray robes, with sashes of various colors around their waists and crowns of different metals upon their heads are kneeling before a blazing white star. The being has the vague appearance of a large human being seated upon a hovering throne encircled by a ring of emerald green fire. Those in the circle are bowing down like Muslims in prayer, touching their foreheads to the glossy floor and laying their crowns down before the throne, giving their power and allegiance to the one enthroned there again and again. Hovering, shifting position, as if orbiting the throne, are four beings of light, each with multiple wings. You cannot make them out with detail, for they are luminescent, yet one is yellow, another is blue, another green, and the last is red. Before you, in the floor, there is a pool about twelve feet across and circular, while glancing back you see a doorway of golden flames. There is a very tall being standing beside you, at least seven feet tall, robed in a brilliant white cloud, with a rainbow nimbus around his, its, her form. The skin as highly polished bronze, with hair like golden light and eyes of white flame. It stands partly in the pool and partly out of the pool, with a hand extended toward you. Step forward, take the hand, and feel warmth and love flood into you. It guides you down the steps of the pool and into the waters, which are cool, almost gelatin-like, moving, surging around your feet, then your legs, then your waist. The entity takes a silver bowl, fills it with the living water and pours it over your head. As it runs down over your phantom form like clear crystal, you feel renewed and the last vestiges of guilt washed away. It leads you out of the water on the opposite side and is then left behind you. Uriel smiles and looks on. As a phantom, you move, gliding toward the throne. You see there a great ram standing before the throne of light, but not of an ordinary form, having seven horns and seven eyes. Its blazing white fleece 
splotched with brilliant crimson. Its head turns, and it sees you approaching. From among the spectators of the stadium comes one who shines as if made of living light. The color of its countenance is, in that moment, revealed by your heart, while its gender is the opposite of your own. The being rushes toward you, and you feel drawn to this person, and feel in your heart that you have always known him or her. Indeed, this person has always been beside you, watching you, listening to you, whispering to you as the voice of conscience. Here before you is your spirit, and you, a ghostly shell of your human self, are the soul. You know his or her name in your heart, or have encountered it in life. It shall never be an archangelic name, neither a god name, and always ends in El, On, or An. Say now, you, and say the name, I thee wed, in all worlds and forms, forever and always join, never parted again, as now and so ever after. By God's will, so let it be done, and what God has united, let no other tear asunder. Amen and Amen. Mortal merges with immortal, and the shell is illumined from a light that fills within. There were two, but now there is only one. A radiant and shining being, neither male nor female, neither flesh nor physical energy, a true and immortal being, undying and reborn anew, standing before the throne of God. See Revelation 4 and Ezekiel's vision. There is a diadem upon your head and wings now bloom from your back. Your angelic appearance I cannot describe, for it is different for each initiate. Gray robes are neutral or balance angels, dark robes are warrior angels, and white robes are ministering angels. Go before the throne now, kneel, and lay your crown before the one, and say, You are worthy, our God and Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. The Lamb, Ram, is beside you, and the crown will become a halo or a diadem of light, and at the Ram's urging you are to take it and set it upon your head. Above your head it shall hang. A name now rises into your mind and heart, and you are to accept the name, save that it be that of an archangel, which would be delusional egotism. Beneath the throne of God there is a book on a golden stand, and you will see the ram transformed into a human being of pure light. The Christ will walk over to the book, and with a silver quill prepare to inscribe the name you have chosen for your living soul into the book of life. The name, if inscribed, will be written with the fiery red ink of Emmanuel's sacrifices. For indeed every prophet and faithful servant of God has suffered and bled for the word, that by the word you might now have the opportunity for eternal life. He, it, will look back at you in unspoken question, and you must verify with a yes or a no whether you wish him to put your name in the book. If you decline, you become fallen and cannot enter before the throne again, save as a mere daydream, and should no longer consider yourself a servant of God, but a wandering star and a servant of the living darkness by default. Before you and around you behold the circular stadium change, the elders kneeling become twenty-four stars of various sizes and shapes. The angels and saints are suns and stars of the galaxy all around you. The being of light upon the throne turns, as if the stadium is upended, and you are now staring down into a deep well of pearlescent, brilliant light. The vortex is alive, circled by a halo of emerald green fire. The being has become the light, and the light is radiating from a realm beyond the universe, a realm of liquidic living power, infinite, eternal, and behind and within all things. Every black hole is, in spirit, light, and each is a gate to the one, 
within which infinite universes drift as black stars in an ocean of living illumination, and clouds of colorful glowing protomatter drift as groups of like-minded living souls. Between you and the gateway stands the ram, as if barring the way, and standing in the radiant mouth of the infinite, a doorway in heaven that no man can shut. When you are ready, you may return to your flesh. You may repeat this exercise until you can visualize it in complete clarity. The cosmic temple is open to all true and faithful Uriens, though none should think to undergo the sacred marriage, lest they have undergone the training that came before it. To cheat and skip ahead is to perform a sham, which will not stick. Here you will in due course note the echoes and phantom shapes of other visitors, some Urian, and others who are of similar but differing paths from all over the galaxy. It is for you to experiment with the sanctuary and delve into the potentials of its design. The stadium can serve many mystical purposes, from mundane to sublime. What exists within the mind exists. The brain does not discriminate between that which is experienced physically and that which is vividly imagined. In note, every healthy man and woman fantasizes in the sexual sense. This is simply a fact. And in the mortal world, it is good to marry one who is of similar allegiance, lest you be yoked unevenly and live in a house divided. However, as long as you live, your soulmate shall be within you, and you shall hereafter live forever. Every fantasy, willfully generated or unconsciously conferred, is now locked in. For no matter who you imagine, it will always be the exact same person, even if wearing a different mask or even more than one. The mate of your soul is your spirit. In traditional societies, marriages are arranged, and in such relationships first comes a contract, then the preparations, then the wedding, and then the work of creating a relationship. As an arranged wedding, all formalities aside, what follows is the building of the relationship soul with spirit. The fourth degree has been completed. Note. The cube is related to Metatron's cube, the Islamic Kaaba, the Apsu, New Jerusalem, and an astral vision. The mist within the dark cube is the astral, also the mist that was over the primordial waters and the mist that was over the land before rain fell, in certain myths. The fiery cube is the innermost sanctum, and one must pass through purification in fire and water, metaphorically, to approach the throne of God. It represents the fire of truth. The black hole, white hole, is the door to the infinite. Four archangels are four elements, as do the four paths, with negative and positive light and darkness as a secondary theme in the pillars, balance. Magenta represents cosmic balance.